Hello, everyone. My name is Jaya Thomas, and I am the founder of Diverse Representation. Thank you so much for tuning in to our roundtable today. For those of you not familiar with Diverse Representation, I just want to take a quick minute to describe what it is. Um, diverse Representation, our mission is to increase the exposure and hiring of Black agents, attorneys, managers, publicists, and executives in the sports and entertainment industry. So if you haven't been to our website yet, www.diverserepresentation.com. We provide the first ever comprehensive directory of Black agents, attorneys, managers, and publicists. Um, if you're not already following us on social media, on Instagram, we are at Diverse Representation, and on Twitter, at Diverse Rep. This is our fourth time doing a roundtable. Um, this is something we've been doing every month since COVID started, except for July. Um, so super excited to, to have this esteemed panel of executives in various facets of the entertainment industry. How today is gonna work is the first 40 minutes, I am gonna ask them questions, and then you're gonna open it up to you, the audience, to ask any questions you would like. You should see a box on your screen for questions. Feel free to type in your questions, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible uh, before the end of today's roundtable. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's panelists. If each of you could tell us your name, where you're located, you and webinar? what you do. And I'll start with you, Melissa. Sure, hi everybody. My name is Melissa Ingram. I am the general manager of Aspire TV. I'm located in Atlanta, Georgia. Did you have something else I needed to say, Jack? Oh, and then just if you could talk a little bit about your role and responsibilities. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, so my role and responsibility as GM of Aspire is, is truly to be a, a spokesperson for the brand. I'm the brand overseer. Um, so when it comes to development of programming, when it comes to thinking about the vision of where Aspire is going, that's me. Um, but I like to say my biggest role is to really develop um, the team that that really is the heartbeat of Aspire. So I take my role as a servant leader, working with some brilliant minds, creative minds, um, and, and really sort of planning out what Aspire will look like in the future. So that's a little snippet. Awesome. How about you, Aaron? Hi, my name is um, Aaron Edmonds. I'm a director of development and production um, for motion pictures at Lionsgate and based out in los angeles and so yeah. what my job is is you know i read a lot i read a lot of scripts books um and shorts um and i hear pitches and the, i evaluate you know if i the potential of that those things becoming feature films and if i think it can be a feature film then i buy it um, and i work with producers to develop the script um, hire by hiring writers, hiring the director, actors, um, and then kind of shepherd the project through production until exhibition. Awesome. And how about you, Chica? Hi, my name is Chica Chukudabello. I am VP of Original Programming in the Drama team at HBO Max. Um, HBO Max is a new streaming platform that is part of the Warner Media umbrella. And my job, I guess, every day is to work with creators, writers, directors, um, in helping them to craft the stories that they want to tell on screen. And um, that's on the series side. Awesome. And I'm gonna stay with you, Chica, for a minute. Um, in your role, what kind of projects um, kind of stick with the HBO Max brand? What kind of projects do you usually look for? What kind of uh, projects usually resonate with you? Yeah, so we're a new platform. We have plenty of platforms to choose from, as you all know. And so our goal right now is to build subscribers. So we're leveraging the brand that of HBO and their their um the brand of telling quality stories and authentic stories and leveraging that across the platform. So that's um, having something for everyone. That's our goal: is to have things for kids, for teens, um, adults as well. And so we're um, Love, you know, first. Sorry, we're leveraging um, we're leveraging the quality that of that brand and 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 leveraging that across the um the platform to to provide some things for everyone. So we 
We're looking for splashy IP. We're looking for authentic stories, authentic voices. I think stories that have something to say, sto stories that um, that come from an authentic and inspired place, I think is, is always our goal. Awesome. And I, I know some people, even, I know you guys are still, HBO Max is very new, so I know some people are like, well, what's the difference between like HBO Max and HBO, and they don't know the difference, so can you just briefly talk about kind of what is the difference between HBO Max and the other um, HBO yeah. platforms? I think um, as, you know, the way we play with our sister networks, because there's a lot of media brands underneath the Warner Media umbrella, so that's DC Comics, that's Warner Brothers, that's HBO. It's, um, it's, it's a, there's a variety of, of IP across that library. And so some of it, sometimes it'll, it'll mean taking some of those properties and turning them into series. And HBO has done that with some of, some of those properties, i.e. The Watchmen. And so we'll be doing, um, I think, some of that as well on the HBO Max side. Um, I, as we, you know, grow and try and, and, zero in on what our identity is. I think I think HBO has kind of already set up the the flagship in terms of like quality programming. And for us it's just finding big splashy titles that still live within that um, quality brand and finding ways to leverage that across so that as we create stuff for, for kids and for teens and for women and for people of color and for um, queer communities those voices kind of are, are resonating through as well for these big splashy titles. Awesome. Um, now I'm going to pivot to you a little bit, Erin. And um, prior to your role at Lionsgate, you did various trainee programs and fellowship programs with different programs such as Film Independent. How helpful were those type of programs with regards to your current role at Lionsgate? And for young people looking to get into the industry, are there any specific fellowship programs, trainee programs, or internship programs you would recommend? Yeah, so those programs were very helpful to me. I moved to Los Angeles from New York in 2013 and just did not have the network to really break into the entertainment industry. And it's super important to, to know people, and I just did not know people. Um, and also didn't have the the training. And so um, my position as a trainee at Sony was amazing because it allowed me to be in all of the development meetings, all of the production meetings. Um, and a lot of times you don't get those opportunities as an assistant or an intern. Um, and so kind of just by being a fly on the wall, I really got to understand and learn um, what the role of an executive is in the filmmaking process. and at Film Independent, um, the program that I was in is Project Involve, and what that program does is it takes emerging directors and writers and producers, um, and you're all on these different tracks. And for me, they have just kind of started this uh, executive track. And as an executive, having the experience that I had at Sony and currently being an assistant at Lionsgate while I was doing that program, I was able to put into practice the things that I was learning and or I previously learned and kind of practice those things in a safe environment where it was you know, low stakes and I could make mistakes. Um, but it was great because it really gave me the confidence to when I actually became an executive to really know what I was doing. Um, and then on top of that, it plugged me into a network of talent. Um, so you know, there were directors and writers that I was in the program with that have gone on to direct episodes of Insecure um, and write other feature films. Um, so it's been great having those connections and being people that we were kind of in the trenches together. And now that we've kind of reached a certain height, um, we can kind of call on each other for uh, to collaborate further. Um, the programs that I would recommend, I think uh, Film Independent is a great program. Um, they have a lot of different um, trainee tracks. Sundance also has a lot of trainee tracks. Um, for writers, Universal Writers Program is an amazing program. Um, there's a lot of great writers that have come out of that program as well. Um, and then I think for more job placement type of programs, I would look at, you know, Time's Up um, and Women in Film. Those are, they, those are great organizations that help you just as far as like being placed uh, in assistant positions, which is important for us. 
Awesome. And what is for anyone who does decide to kind of go through one of these programs, what is one piece of advice you would give them as they navigate, um, you know, through one of these type of programs? I think it's just it, embrace the process um, and and don't be afraid to to fail and just to push and to do, you know, take full advantage of the opportunity. Um, it, it, you really are in a space where I think sometimes people, they focus so much on what the next step is and trying to prove themselves for the next step instead of just being present um, and understanding that there's a lot that you have to learn um, and being, you know, humble enough to, to learn that stuff so that you can move forward in your career. So it's really just embrace the entire process. Now I'm going to pivot to you, Melissa. Um, for those of those who are attending who may not be as super familiar with Aspire, can you talk a little bit about the type of programming that Aspire has um, and just kind of a, a little background about the network? Yeah, awesome. So Aspire was founded in 2012 by Irvin Magic Johnson, and his premise was really to sort of bring families back around the television again. Um, and so when I took the seat in 2016, I started realizing that that's not necessarily how we watch television anymore. Um, and so we started looking at what's the landscape, like where's the opportunity really for Aspire, right? There's BET, there's TV One, there's Clio, there's BET Her, there's so many great networks that are already existing. Like what's that space that needs to be filled? Um, and so we started noticing that a lot of Blacks were watching lifestyle programming. They're watching HGTV, they're watching cooking, they're watching food, right? Um, but they're not seeing themselves being represented in that. And so we started to think like, what if you sort of created this intersection of black culture and urban lifestyle, right? Um, and, and that really became sort of the vision for Aspire today. So we have programming cooking, we have home design, um, but we also anchor ourselves in sort of those iconic representations of black culture. So in Living Color, Bernie Mac show, In the House just came on, um, premiered last weekend. So that's really where we are. And I think the vision for where we want to go is to really be sort of a, you know, HGTV, but with the experiences of a black life. Um, we like to say, we look at the black experience and how the black audience does these five things, eat, live, shop, plays, and dreams. And we are empowering them not just to eat, but to eat well, not just to live, live your life. You only got one, not just to, to, uh, to shop, but to shop with purpose and intention. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and not just work hard, but play hard. And most importantly, not just dream, but dream big. So those five verticals sort of inform our programming decisions and how we see um, lifestyle playing out on air. Amazing. Um, I, I don't know how often, you know, people or content creators, I'm sure a lot of them don't directly pitch to you, but your colleagues. Um, but I'm sure you've seen like a lot of pitches come through the door. What are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen content creators make with regards to pitching their projects? Honestly, um, the biggest mistake is not knowing the brand that you're pitching to. Um, so <laughs> it happens a lot. People come in and they're like, oh, I got this scripted series. <laughs> I'm like, we don't have budget for that. That's not what we do. Um, and, and it hurts, it pains me to be able to tell somebody because I'm like, you could have easily just looked at our website and sort of, you know, garnered the information that you needed. So I, I think that's the number one mistake um, to just, just not being prepared overall, um, not understanding like what's, what would it take to make, to make this, right? You're coming to me pitching this and you have no idea in terms of all the logistics and budget and, and, and sort of thinking it through, right, before you brought it to me. So um, I don't know if Aaron and Chica have, have any other things to add to that, but I, I think the biggest mistake for me is not understanding the Aspire brand and knowing who you're pitching to. Yeah, I, I agree with, you know, understanding the audience and knowing who you're pitching to. I mean, I think that's chief among um, the mistakes that can be made. I think um, in addition to that, though, I'd say, you know, really, like you said, like coming prepared, like having a full take, I think, yeah. you know, you know, you have to understand that you are, you're pitching a project to me. And then if I'm like really excited about this project, I need to be able to take the information that I just heard in that 45 minute hour long meeting, synthesize that, and then 
pitch it to my boss and sell them and then they need to be able to sell their bosses so you know really being prepared oh. um and having a full understanding of the story you're trying to tell um so that it's easy for other people to to repeat that information is super important yeah i'd say like because a good pitch had there are beats that you know you can break down a good pitch into and a lot of times people think having a good idea is enough and 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 and, and it's not and so i think having access to someone who can kind of help you um, formulate and mold your pitch and show you kind of where the gaps are um, so that you can have prepared answers for the questions that are coming and just know that you're coming in with something that feels fleshed out that people can see going for multiple seasons if it's a series um, and that you have kind of a body of work or at least sample material to show that you can actually pull off this thing that you're trying to sell you know give get me to give you money to do um, those are all yeah important yeah, I, kind of, I just want to double down on something that you just said. Like, I think um, having a strategy is really important. So knowing that, like, you know, if you are a first time writer um, mm -hmm. and, and it's not to say that, you know, you're you're not very skilled. But if you're a first time writer and you don't have samples of work, what are other things that you can bring into that pitch so that that's not the reason why someone is saying no to you? Yeah. So. Is it partnering with a very well-known director or producer? Is it yeah. attaching an actor? But having something else that kind of just balances it out so that there's something else that you know we can use to, to sell. Yeah, and to and to piggyback off of that, I think what's great about um, young and new talent is that they have these really big, cool ideas and they're able to think outside of the box because they haven't learned what the box looks like. Um, but then also with those big ideas is the ability to execute and so partnering like Aaron said with someone whether it's in a supervisor capacity or just someone attached who has the who's put in their 10,000 hours has the body of work and the resume to show that like hey I've done this I've shown I can do this and I can help this person do what they're trying to do as well um, because a lot of the people who have been doing this for a long time they want to mentor they want to help people kind of come up and get their own stripes so that they can pass it on. And so um, finding those people, I know that's not always the easiest thing to do, but if you're um, if you're trying to pitch me like the next Star Wars, then that's a big idea. So <laughs> it's gonna take a lot of a big team or at least an experienced team to show that like, hey, I can, I can pull this off. Definitely. And my next question is open to all of you. I want to talk a little bit about networking. Um, networking is such an important skill set in this industry. Are there any specific um, suggestions you would give to people looking to do a better job of networking within the industry? And the second part of my question is, especially during COVID times, um, are you finding any other specific networking techniques um, are more successful than not? Just kind of what's your overall take on networking in this industry and, and ways to be successful at it? Um, I can say I did a lot more networking when I was getting started. Um, and I think there are some organizations that are really good at that. I, I, I always tell my assistants and my interns, JHRTS, for, for people who are interested in television, JHRTS is, stands for the Junior Hollywood Radio and Television Society is made up of assistants and coordinators who all work in different aspects of television whether it's production companies um production companies uh, agencies uh studios networks so it's what happens is that when you work at one place um so i i remember um getting actively involved with jhrts when i was working at bet you tend to work with the same talent over and over again and if you're trying to grow and, and want to get, kind of get outside of your bubble and get to know other people, it can be really hard to do that on a day to day basis if you're not making those calls to to that kind of talent. So I um, I think get they hold a lot of panels like this, actually, and they do a lot of roundtables where they give you access to executives all over, you know, all over Hollywood. And, and, and they're really good about making them feel contained and intimate. I remember um, being an assistant, and they had a roundtable with, I think, a VP at, at, at HBO, HBO at the time, I think, 
And so it was like 10, 15 people in a room, just at a conference room, where you just got to ask questions and pick their brain about their career and their experience. And there, you get to learn people's best practices that way. And then, um, you know, there are always mixers that are happening that are also good ways. I know COVID, no one's mixing like that anymore. <laughs> But um, I think they've kind of pivoted to virtual mixers and um, like little uh, match, not matchmaking, but like kind of speed dating type of events to kind of give you that, you know, intimate time, but like on a, on a condensed basis so that you can kind of feel like you're getting to know people without having, um, without being there physically in person. But yes, it's, it's, it's the business is a very relationship driven business. I think a lot of times it's easier if you get started at, at an agency. I know this, you'll, you'll hear that a lot is that like agency experience required or agency experience preferred. And yes, that's a good thing. It's really hard though for people who, especially if you're a college graduate and you are coming out with student loans because it is well known that agency assistants don't get paid a lot. And so if you have options, you're probably gonna Use an option that can help you pay back those loans fa faster, um, and so it is—it's an investment of time, I think. Um, but it is mm -hmm. one if you're able to to figure it out, because when you start off at a desk at an at an agency, you and your starting class, you're kind of like a, a graduating class of sorts. It's like a grad school, and so you'll learn. Um, like Aaron was saying, like a lot of these programs, they teach you a lot of the tricks of the trade in low stakes environments. And so at the assistant level, that's your chance to do that. But it's also your chance to do that, you know, locked arms with other people who are also starting. And and um, I think what I've just, what I've found is that the some of the most painful career experiences, the people that you're going through them with, those are like your friends for life. And so even though you all start off on desks at agencies, you're all gonna graduate and go on to other companies and, in addition to one of the reasons our business is such a relationship driven business is because it's an information driven business. And so if I'm working at HBO Max for a second and I want to have, you know, I'm, I'm curious about some information about a project at Disney. If there's so-and-so who I've worked with 10 years ago when we're all on desk that I've maintained um, contact with and, and maintained a relationship with over the years, like I can call that person and get a very quick answer which um, which is valuable currency in the business that we work in. And so, you know, just being open, being human, and just, you know, trying to find not natural ways to connect with people because I know networking can sometimes feel like a dirty word and feels like, oh, I'm, I'm being fake or inauthentic. And there's a way to do it that feels natural to you. And I, I encourage people to find find that way for them. Yeah, I think there's also um, some great organizations out there that people can get involved with. Um, I know an attendee in listen only mode. Did y'all hear that? I heard that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, Women in Cable Telecommunications, NAMIC, um, these are all organizations that I want to encourage people. They all have boards, right? So at a time like this, getting involved, offering your skill set to that organization, to that board, will then allow you to meet people that have been in the industry for years. And I think that's the, that's a way to sort of easily navigate the, the uneasiness of, of networking, right? So it's not necessarily forced, but it's like, I'm working on this board with you. We have the same mission, we have the same goal. But I think, you know, COVID is interesting. People are getting really creative. I mean, please don't do this for me, but you know, wanna do a lunch date, send an Uber Eats to the person you wanna do lunch with and, and set up the time. Don't do it for me, uh, do it for Aaron. Uh, but I think people can really get creative and, and think about, I mean, virtual is sort of going to be our new, I don't think we're going back to what we knew as, yeah. as what we knew. Um, so I think people are going to have to get more and more creative. I think it's also a great time to do your research, you know, get on LinkedIn, study people, understand what they do, and then reach out to them. I think it's always great when people want to form relationships and they're looking to sort of serve rather than what can you, what can I get from you? What can I take from you? But rather, here's what I can offer. Um, and so I just want to encourage people while they're sort of trying to navigate. And I know some people are trying to get into the industry. 
to always have sort of a servant leadership mind and a heart to sort of think about what can I offer and bring to the table rather than, you know, I just want to pick your brain and I just want to take, take, take from you. So. Another organization is Color Entertainment, which uh, Color, C-O-L-O-U-R. Um, they have Color Assistants and they have Color, I think, Associates. And that mm -hmm. is also, I think they cover TV and film for um, individuals of color and they, they're, they're great at having events as well. Yeah, um, I think awesome. when I think about, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, in thinking about networking, I think the the real important thing is to kind of do a mind shift and really think of it more of just like relationship building. Because it, when you are approaching it as just like, this is a relationship that I'm building, that, you know, that already signifies that there's time investment, there's sometimes monetary sounds investment, but it's really about building a, sometimes a friendship. Um, and then I also sad. think it's looking at it on Can two tracks. To Mama, it's time for my, my IT. Sorry, I'm on a Zoom. I think um, <laughs> I think it's looking at it on uh, two tracks. I think you have to look at um, how are you building relationships with your peers, and then how are you building relationships? Well, really, I guess it's three tracks depending upon where you are. But the people above you from a mentor perspective, and then the people that are coming up um, underneath you from a mentorship perspective as well. Um, and so I think uh, just how Melissa was saying, like really having a service mind, I think is important for all three of those different relationships, but also understanding just where your place is within all three of those relationships is important. Yeah. So like on a peer level, that is a lot of the, the times where you can, you know, share information. It is the person that like you've kind of been through the trenches with, um, you're coming up together, um, you know, you're doing a lot of the drinks and things like that together as well, which we aren't doing right now because of uh, COVID. And then from, you know, when it's a mentor person, that's the one where it's like you want to be conscious of like, you know, what you're asking for. You want to be conscious of the time. You know, what would be your advice to take advantage of this new shift, of this new way of thinking um, across the board? What is going on? <laughs> I don't know. I just got to. It's every day. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, but you want to also just be very intentional about the ask that you ask, how much time you're you're taking of that person. And then also just like what you can, thinking about what you can give and offer to that person. Um, there are a lot of people that I, I am very giving with my time because there are a lot of people that were super giving to me of their time. Um, but there are some people who, you know, might just hit me up and it's like a five or 10 minute conversation that doesn't really, go anywhere and it's not really fruitful and there are other people where it's like you know there's an email exchange they really take the time to build a relationship or do research before they approach me and have a conversation yeah. um and then that goes to my third point of like the people that are coming up below you i think that's also important just especially as you know people of color in this industry just trying to make sure that we're continuing to build up the next generation so that we don't have gaps when it comes to executives because i do think we're at a very special time right now in the history of Hollywood where there are a lot of executives doing a lot of different things across the industry um, where it's like I can you know call a producer and it can be someone who is you know of color or black and we have an understanding or I can call someone from another studio we have an understanding there's actually somebody there and that it wasn't like that before so I think it's important for us to continue to make sure that we're you know growing the next generation so that um, we continue to have more of us um, as things go. So, yeah, and I think it's it's so important what you're doing, Jaya. I think this whole concept of diverse representation is so necessary, and I think it's it's the directory. I mean, how easy is it to sort of find people now? So, kudos yeah. to you and, and and this platform. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, my next question for for all of you guys is. Um, if you could change one thing about the industry, what would it be? Ooh. Well, Ooh. I'm gonna start with this, since it's uh, it's Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Just pay us. <laughs> <laughs> start here. That's one. <laughs> Um, but I, in all seriousness, I mean that's across all industries. I mean, Black women are making 62 cents to 
our white male counterparts dollar. So, um, and we're having to work seven and a half months more to make what, what they make in a year. Um, so I think that's one, right? Um, but I also think I would, I would change the way in which people in this industry who have been in this industry for a long time see us and value us, I guess, um, and put dollars behind development, put dollars behind training, um, giving us access. I mean, I guess you may want to call it industry reparations, like give us access to learn these new platforms, um, put us in positions to where we can develop to become the next VP, GM, CEO, CFO. Um, I think that's very necessary for the industry to sort of back that and to put dollars behind um, the elevation of people of color. Yeah, I, along those lines, I would say, I wish that it recognized that our differences really are, and I'm stealing this from someone and I can't recall who, but our differences really are our superpowers. That we, the more diverse the ecosystem that we work in and operate in, the more varied and authentic the stories that we're able to tell. And so that see, working alongside people who come from a different background or come from a different set of experiences from you actually only brings more voices to the table so that we can have a better and a stronger conversation as we're putting together a story and figuring out, okay, what's the best way forward? Because we all have blind spots. And, and so the more we cover our blind spots with the people that are around the table, the less we can get caught out there after the investment is made and it's too late. And so yeah. if we had caught like there's a, we've all seen the um the fallout from whatever campaign that it's like nobody caught that like no one <laughs> and so those are the kinds of mistakes that happen when you don't have enough voices at the table or enough varied experiences at the table and that's that's ethnicity it's it's economics it's regional it's all of the above and i think one of the um one of the benefits i think even of covid now i think with our internship program we've been able because we're still doing virtual internships um, at hbo max and at warner media is we've been able to pull in interns who don't who couldn't fly to los angeles to be there physically or couldn't afford that expense and so now they can you know whether you're in kansas or you're in oklahoma like you can you can still get a job working because everyone's doing it from home and so i'd be curious, yeah to see like five years from now like how that plays out in terms of as those people start to come up um, and their their um, careers start to grow, like again, the diversity at the table and, and how that informs the work that we all do. Yeah, I think, um, I think the thing that I would want to change is just the way that um, marketing and international sales teams look um, and to make them more diverse. I think there's a lot of programs, um, executive training programs and things like that for a lot of the other disciplines within entertainment. Um, and I think oftentimes, at least in the film side, um, our marketing departments are not diverse and our international sales departments are not diverse. And that has a lot of bearing on the types of movies that are made and how they're sold um, and marketed to people. And so I think just having more people of color in those departments um, really would make a huge difference in what movies get greenlit and um, how those movies are presented to the public as well. Um, I'd also say, I think just from a cultural perspective, I think as an industry, um, valuing experience from other industries, um, I think, you know, we're very apprentice-based um, in the way that people get promoted and work their way up. And sometimes, you know, a lot of, you know, people who've been in this business for a long time, it, it ends up blocking out a lot of people, particularly us. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people of color and black people have, they're approaching this either older in their careers or just from another industry, um, another type of experience. And it's hard to break in because people aren't able to value um, what they've done and how it translates over to what they're trying to do. And so I think culturally changing that, it would definitely open up a lot of doors for um, from a diversity perspective. And definitely. the other thing, one more thing, there's, um, because 
there is there has been a growing recognition of like oh we need to like you know people are looking for black writers let's let's make sure our our roster includes more of those clients but then the reps that are repping them don't always Ooh. necessarily pitch them in the best manner and and i and i get like it everyone for right for for those of, of the audience who are writers like talk to your managers talk to your agents make sure you understand what they're saying when they're calling executives to, to to drum up interest in you as a writer because there's a tendency to kind of lead with tragedy porn which is not necessarily telling me more about your voice and it it, show, it shows a short-sightedness not on the writer's part but on the rep's part to understand what makes their client unique and special so that they can pitch that specialness to me and pique my interest and be like i need to read that person's sample I, and that's not to say bad things haven't happened to a lot of writers because that is that is part of, of you know people's experience. But I can sense sometimes that there is when the push for diversity is like sometimes perceived as the push for tragic stories, and that is yes. not like we have yeah. the same coming of age stories. We fall in love we fall out with friends we like we experience the full gamut of human emotions and human experiences and those things are just as important to us as some of the more tragic ones and i think yeah, that, I, that's such a huge point because it's yeah. like when you're right when people are talking about the push for diversity especially on the writer side it's just like oh well if there is a black story then we'll get our list of black writers and it's like i want every single project that i'm on every single list i don't care if the actor is white there's black people and there are women on that list and yeah. so it's super important for reps to understand that um but i also think for you know other executives to understand that too like it's like you know the same way that we've historically had all these white writers writing our stories like we can write other people's stories too we can write stories that don't have to do with you know our identity and our race like mm -hmm. that's the world we live in so yeah <laughs> one of my last questions before i open up the q a from the audience for people looking to learn more about the entertainment industry are there any specific books you would recommend podcasts websites any resources that you would recommend that have been helpful to you? I think websites like, I mean, obviously there's the standard deadline, variety, shadow and act. Um, I think Blavity now owns shadow and act, but they also do um, stories there as well. Um, Hollywood those, Reporter. Yeah, Hollywood Reporter. Those are, those are staples that should be in your diet in terms of, you know, staying on top of what's happening and what deals are getting made. Yeah, I would just add, there's also Synopsis, which is sort of gives me a daily briefing of what's happening um, with the C. Well. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah with a C. With a C. <laughs> C-Y-N, yes. Um, as well as, um, I was going to say Owler, too. I don't know if you guys, it, it's Owl, E-R, Owler. Okay. It's another I would say also this is um, something that I got from uh, someone in our story department, but like even like looking at things like Reddit and, and things like that, just more from a standpoint of like understanding trends and, and, and things that people are thinking about and what's kind of sticky, because a lot of times those are, those are the types of stories that we want to be creating um, and what's going to sell, because we're kind of trend forecasting um, when we're looking at, you know, what we want to buy, like what's going to make sense two years from now in the future space, what's going to make sense, you know, a year from now or a couple of years from now in the television space as well. And so looking at Reddit and just having an understanding of like what people are talking about in different subcultures. Um, I, I'd say also um, drawing inspiration just from other arts, like going to museums, um un, you know concerts things like that there's a lot of ideas and stuff that come out of that from the creative side and then um researching people like as you're trying to figure out you know what you want your career to look like 
uh, I think looking at either content that you really, really like and trying to figure out who's the director of that or who created that, who produced that, and then doing a deep dive research session on how that person got to that point um, is super helpful and just invaluable because then that'll take you down other tracks of just ideas of what you can do for your group. Um, Olivia Morris, who is a, an exec at Kerry Washington's company, um, oversees a, an email distribution list for the plug. So they have a lot of um, job postings as well that, that <coughs> plugged into. Yeah, I think Erin made a great point about just being a student of culture. I think we can never stop doing that. I mean, I think that's super important. It's always going to be sort of a differentiating point when you come to the table that you're able to speak about different culture. And this this really is going to be my last question before opening it up to the audience. <laughs> but how can people who are tuned in, how can they support what you guys are doing? Subscribe to HBO Max. Okay. I have Roku. That was so quick. You were ready. I love that. <laughs> when is it going to get on Roku? I'm like, I had HBO Go and now I'm stuck. Chris, there are people who are actively working. That is coming oh, soon. Great. I can't wait. <laughs> I cannot wait. You and me both. Yeah, watch us fire. I mean, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, Facebook. If you still have it, I know we're, we're talking to a lot of people who cut the cord. Um, so there are some platforms, OTT platforms that we're on as well, but just become a fan. Just, you know, spread the word, talk about us, uh, keep us top of mind because we're doing something different. Um, I would say buy Antebellum on September 18th um, when it goes on demand That's um, really right. and, and talk about yeah. it. It's going to be, there will be a lot of conversations after that movie and I'm excited to to hear what people think and, and just what is sparked by it. So yeah, watch it, buy it, talk about it. Excited. Awesome. Okay, so now we have a ton of questions. I'm gonna try to get through as many as possible. Uh, but the first question is, based on your experiences, do you think white agents can actually pitch non-white clients effectively? I think there are some that do it really well. And I um, I want to shout out one, uh, Kelly. She's at a management company called Literate, right? Am I, oh, she used to be at Paradigm. I think she's at Literate now. She, like she's super like plugged into like the theater world. I didn't know that there were like a ton of playwrights of color like doing their thing in New York that she has put me onto. And, it's almost like a good manager, a good agent will meet with an executive, find out what they care about. And it's almost like dating. It's almost like they will set, like a matchmaking service. They will set you up on dates with their clients that you will connect and resonate with. And Kelly has always hit it out the park. Like that's what a good agent or a good manager does. It's like they, uh, they get to know both sides really, really well. And then they're like, you know what? this person has this kind of experience that I think would work really well for the things that you have an appetite for. And you guys just, just have coffee. Like there's something special about this person. They'll know what is special to you because they've taken the time to get to know, you know, what you care about. So the, the short, the last, the long answer, the short answer is yes, but not, not all of them take the time and energy to do that. Okay. The next question is, how do you show value and let skills translate into a new field? How do you show value and let I think I think you have to understand what skills are going to be valuable and what you're transitioning into. Um, and so I, I I'll give an example like when I first graduated um, from college from undergrad I was in politics. So I was a deputy campaign manager for a city council candidate. Um, but in that experience, like I helped, you know, build out that campaign um, and had to, you know, schedule uh, speeches and come up with like what was going to be 
you know, what was our platform and things like that and working with the campaign manager and strategizing and all that stuff. So there was a lot of work that I was doing in that calling um, people to, to donate to the campaign and coming up with a strategy for that. So all of the work that I was doing there translates into me being a good executive from the standpoint of knowing how to talk to a lot of different people, um, being able to be personable and relatable fairly quickly, um, but also just being able to use the side of my brain to think strategically and not just creatively about stuff, um, which is important as, a, as an executive because you're kind of using both because you're speaking to directors, but then you're also speaking to people within your own business about how this project is going to add value to the company. So I think um, it took me some time to, again, research <laughs> understanding like the different roles and positions within entertainment to know that like okay I have these different skill sets and these experiences um i know that this is valuable as an executive what are the different tracks um that i can tackle to become an executive and then making sure that i'm constantly selling myself on those attributes that i've sharpened in my other experiences um, so I think once you figure out where you want to go, then you can kind of start building that story of how it will transition. Yeah, I would say get in where you fit in. I, I went to business school undergrad and worked as an IT consultant. So I, my first job was working in business development at a studio, knowing good and well that I had no interest in continuing along that path. But I was like, just let me in the door and then I'll figure the rest out when I get in there. And so, um, yeah, just the the long-term goal doesn't always have to match the short-term goal mm -hmm. just get your foot in the door get get the information get the access and that then you can kind of work once you're in there towards the longer term goal next question is do you have any advice for those who may be in middle management a lot of advice is usually targeted to beginners but what would you say to someone who has a few years in the industry and are still having a hard time elevating to the next step of their career in this industry? Good question. Um, um, I, go ahead, go, go ahead. One of the things I would say is um, they need to be looking at sort of who's sponsoring them, right? Like who's an advocate for them. Um, and if they don't have one, they need one within the company. I'm not sure where exactly they are, but I think it's super important that you have somebody that can advocate for you in your promotion and your elevation. And so oftentimes we think, oh, I'm just going to do it on my own. It, this industry is tricky. And we said it's a lot about relationship building. And so you have to build sort of those relationships, not only with your peers, but not only with your boss, but with your boss's friends and with your boss's peers. Because those are when those people meet and they're in the room, you want to be top of mind. So I would just say, hey, encourage find a sponsor and find an advocate. And if you don't have one, you know, start networking. Great one. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that. Oh, you go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No. <laughs> I was going to say, I agree. Like you need sponsors within your company, but also having mentors outside of the company who also act as sponsors because, <laughs> you know, you're either going to move up within that company or you're going to look for a job elsewhere and you will need people calling on your behalf um, to say, you know, sing your praises if you're going elsewhere. And so having people within your company and on the outside that can speak highly of you is super important. Um, and then I'd also say like, not only that, I think it's also taking advantage of opportunities outside of just like what your regular business function is. And so I think like a good example is, you know, with everything that's been going on with the, the protests, there's a lot of, you know, black people within their organizations where they're the only one or it's one in another person. And they've had to take on, you know, roles of leadership as far as like how how do we as a company make changes within our company that help us become more inclusive? Um, how do we change our messaging um, externally so that people understand that this is something that's important to us? And so I think like finding, you know, it doesn't have to be as big as that as far as like something happening that starts that but finding opportunities where you can show value of how you want to improve the company outside of just like your regular job 
And I would say also, like, if you, like, to what Melissa's point said earlier, if you find someone within the organization, someone who can sponsor you, but someone who can also give you feedback about how you're showing up, because sometimes we feel like we're doing all the work that we can, but there might be just like one small little you know, shift that we might need to make in the way, whether it's public speaking or confidence or whatever, who, someone who you trust, whose opinion you trust to give you like honest feedback about sometimes, you know, maybe shift this thing or tweak that thing. And, um, and that can be, you know, make all of the difference. And so finding those people who can kind of hold that mirror up to you in a way that you Keep happening. What's happening? What's up, man? You got the wrong phone number at the end of the reel. I don't know who phone number is that. It's like you mix my phone number, and my, my cell number, and my office number together. Oh, no, not with the that is on. Can you please mute yourself? Everyone should be muted. Yeah, that was it, but you used the wrong prefix. You used my cell phone prefix. Participants are uh, not. Not 634. Aaron said, this is 2020. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. <laughs> We can just call it right there right now and repeat the number to me. Um, let's go to C three four myself. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. Just giving them um, information. I don't have or... the phone, or I think all the attendees are. Yeah, here. I think you did. Let me get uh, the office number. Okay. The first three in the last so, right? We're gonna try to go to the next. The last four is right because that's the office, but oh. the first three is in the cell. Let me, let me look at my, uh, this might be our cue, Jack. <laughs> I'm sorry. This might be our cue that we just need to. I about know. To take what's happening? I think he's done. <laughs> he's figured it out. Okay. And he may be tired. Got the wrong. office number. Like y'all better write this down. Write this number down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question, real quick, before. Okay. So the next question. Um. Sorry, guys. And I knew this question was coming. Um, so the okay. next question is for any for everyone on the panel, uh, if I have right a manager quick. or agent video. that can send you a project, <laughs> what is the best way to go about sending projects to your respective it's company? Four, two, four. Are you looking for packages? Four, one, scripts, sizzles? Okay. How should I go about sending? my project okay. for us the way things come in through reps we aren't really you know we're, we aren't really able to take unsolicited submissions so usually you know part of what agent what an agent's job is yeah. to, to get to know what all the different platforms are. yeah that's yeah. so i mean that's the office that's the office know that i'm looking yeah. for if you know I'm looking for a big graphic novel out of paper, you won't bring me like a small story about you know a child or Wait, what, what number is it? I mean, so it's, two, four, six, seven, two, four, four, it's being four, informed six, about the client has to offer years. and knowing what the marketplace is looking for <laughs> so that you can make those appropriate matches. It's a lot so harder to do when you're when you're not as plugged in and don't have um the the so yeah. that's part of the reason why we don't take like uh, random yeah. um, put, put the office on there. Yeah, I just gotta change that to four one. Okay, can you go to the office? Yeah. Guys, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I think yeah. this is get off of the uh, platform. Dude, get off okay. of the platform. Oh, right up out of here. I gotta take care of a few things real quick. Okay. Yeah, it's high video right, audio. Well. Sorry, it's completely um Drowning everybody out. <clears throat> this has been fun, Jaya. <laughs> yeah. I think he's off now. Sorry, I'm so sorry. T, if you want to finish what you were saying, I think he's off. No, I was just saying. So, okay, wait. I, the, I think the question was, how does someone get stuff material to us? And I think yeah, the question was, if you have representation, what is the best way to pitch um, a project to each of your respective companies? Yeah, I mean, your your agents should kind of already, part of their job is to get to know all of the executives that are out there and what exactly it is they're looking for. So, you know, a good agent would kind of already know this this network is looking for X, that network is looking for Y, and I have Z to pitch. So they won't bring Z to the people that are looking for X and Y. They will bring 
you know, why to the people that are looking for why. And so if you have a client and they have a client whose story, you know, kind of fits within the, you know, a certain <clears throat> length, they will reach out to the networks and the platforms that are looking for that thing and set up and set up the pitches. And the, uh, they'll have the relationships. I take calls from agents and managers all the time. Um, ones that I've met before and ones that I haven't. Um, just because there's kind of that established trust of like, okay, this is how it works. They already get that part. And so you've kind of cleared a hurdle at least with that, with that much. And so, yeah. I would say too, um, I think all of that also just being aware of like the current moment that we're in. So if this person is a writer, um, I would say like, you know, write your stuff. Like, yeah. There's, you know, we're in this moment where offices have been shut down, productions are just starting to get back, and there's been a lot of writers who have spent this time writing a lot of spec scripts, um, and so those have been moving a lot more than just coming in with a pitch. So be aware of the fact that, like, there are a lot of people out there that have been, you know, grinding and working, so make sure that you're doing the same. And that like when you are presenting something, um, you're just keeping that in mind. And we're staffing writers rooms too. So, you know, those, like you said, those are the people that are still working and still getting checked. So if you have representation, like you're, make sure your representation understands what shows are getting staffed up because we are, we are constantly putting together rooms so that when we can go into production post COVID, you know, we have those scripts banked up. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm so sorry for all the tech issues. Um, thank you. But thank you guys so much okay. for taking the time uh, to do this roundtable. And thank you all for tuning in um, to the roundtable today as well. Do you guys have any other final thoughts before we close? I remember my, my assistant texted me while we were talking. Kelly Miller at Literate is the is the manager who is kind of who's excellent at pitching her clients. And awesome. it'll be as thoughtful. Yeah. <laughs> I would okay. just say just as we're closing out, just everybody be encouraged. I think we're in an interesting time and things are changing. So let's let's all collectively bring each other up to be a part of the change. Hundred percent. I love that. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you to everyone. Who thank you. Thank you. Please stay tuned for future events, hopefully without any tech issues. Um, okay. Everyone have a great week. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.